Hello, my name is John Grossman, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. And I'd like to welcome you to the seventh session of our fall webinar series. This evening's talk is titled, Hemlock Bark and Wisconsin's Tanning Industry. The World Walked on Milwaukee Leather, offered by our presenter, John Bates. John is the author of nine books and a contributor to seven others, all of which focus on the natural history of the Northwoods. He's worked as a naturalist in Wisconsin's Northwoods for 30 years, leading an array of trips and giving talks, all designed to help people further understand the remarkable diversity and beauty of nature and our place within it. His most recent book, Our Living Ancestors, <clears throat> The History and Ecology of Old Growth Forests in Wisconsin, and where to find them. He has served on the board of trustees for the Wisconsin Nature Conservancy, the Wisconsin Humanities Council, and the River Alliance of Wisconsin. He, is, he currently serves on the board of the Northwoods Land Trust and the board of the, for the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. John has a master's of science in environmental sciences from UW Green Bay. He and his wife, fiber artist Mary Burns, live on the Manitouish water, or excuse me, the Manitouish River in Iron County where they've raised two daughters. As I now hand off to our presenter, please consider a couple of issues to aid the success of this webinar. First, note questions you may have for the presenter during the presentation, and then take time to pose them via the chat feature in Zoom at the bottom of your screen. If you're new to Zoom and have challenges navigating the system, pose a question to get help from our facilitator also using that feature. And finally, please be aware that tomorrow you will receive a follow-up email from Zoom with a link to an evaluation form on a survey monkey. Please reflect on tonight's presentation and take time to complete the form for us. Following the advice that all of life really is connected across the miles and years, you can help us better connect by offering productive feedback and keeping our connection to the public we serve healthy and up to date. And now along with you, we look forward to this evening's presentation. Just checking in, is the screen on for you guys? Sure is. Here it is? All righty. Great, thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be a part of this conference. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, I wanna tell a story about uh, Wisconsin's engagement with hemlock trees. And this, there's two stories that I wanna tell. One is about the tanneries of, of Wisconsin, and one is about the hemlock, Eastern hemlock tree itself, its ecology, some of its history of how, how it arrived here and what its status is today. So let's jump in on, at least on the ecology of, of hemlock trees. Interesting range for, for Eastern hemlocks. Um, it's a tree that really requires a lot of uh, moisture and cool, coolness. So it's a, it's a tree found almost solely in, uh, in Wisconsin anyway, in Northern Wisconsin, up into the UP and across into the Northeastern US up into Maine and uh, up into a, a bit of Quebec there and then down in the Appalachian Mountains. You'll notice on the range map that in Wisconsin, it doesn't even make it to our Western border and it's uh, hardly findable whatsoever when you get into Minnesota. Uh, and that's a function, as I understand it, of the fact it just doesn't tolerate drier conditions. And as you go further west, uh, the climate gets drier. And so hemlock falls out as, as, it, uh, as we head over towards Minnesota. Hemlock was the last, uh, major tree species to make its way back to Wisconsin after glaciation. Um, it invaded in the Sylvania wilderness area, which is just across our, our border uh, by Land O'Lakes, uh, only about 3,000 years ago, and it, it reached its present range boundary only about 1,000 years ago. So it's a relative newcomer uh, to northern Wisconsin into the UP. They can get really big. Uh, if you're down in the Smoky Mountains, you can find some giant eastern hemlock trees Biggest one's 175 feet tall and over six feet in diameter breast height. They can get really old. It's not uncommon at all for hemlocks to be three to 400 years old. The oldest recorded that I can find in the literature is 550 years old. There's one that's unverified that's in the literature uh, as being 988 years old. I don't know, to be honest. Uh, 
but they can get uh, quite old, 500 plus years. And they don't necessarily have to be big to, uh, to be old. Eastern hemlocks can withstand uh, suppression and shade. They can sit in the understory for a uh, hundred years and only be an inch in diameter, basically in, in kind of a uh, suspended state, uh, waiting for an opening in the canopy, waiting for the big grandmother tree above them to fall over and then make a race into that canopy. So uh, you can look at a, a slide like this of, of a relatively smaller looking hemlock stand and think, well, those must not be very old hemlocks, but in fact, they could be three to 400 years old, but have been suppressed for the first hundred or more years of their life in the shade and still being suppressed to some degree until they finally can get up into the canopy. So uh, size doesn't equal age whatsoever for, for Eastern hemlock trees. The keynote of Eastern hemlocks is really the dense foliage. Uh, if you've ever walked into an Eastern hemlock forest, they are dark, dark places. Leave your uh, suntan lotion at home. Uh, it will, you'll never have a use for it in there. It's 24-7 it's shaded, a dark place. And uh, it's a place that, you know, if you think back into being a settler, coming into Northern Wisconsin and, and, and coming into an Eastern hemlock stand, you would, you would not know really what to do with it. It's, it's so dark. There's very little that grows in the understory as a general rule because you have an acid understory from all the needle fall over centuries and you have perpetual shade underneath there. So uh, most people coming into uh, Northern Wisconsin really were a bit flummoxed about how to, how to deal with an Eastern hemlock tree. We talk about disturbance regimes for old growth forests, forests in general, and uh, a number of forests are, are based uh, disturbance wise and fire, quite the opposite for Eastern hemlock because it's such a dense foliage, the understory remains moist throughout the year and it's, it's uh, labeled the asbestos forest. It's very difficult for a hemlock forest to burn simply because it's so moist. If they do burn, it's usually because there's been a blowdown and there's been an ensuing drought. And at that point, maybe, uh, hemlock forest can burn, but ordinarily it's just too doggone moist. If you're a, f a firefighter, uh, you don't necessarily like hemlock forest because they can they can grow you out of a job because uh, they simply don't catch on fire. It's a wind disturbance place, so uh, you'll see blowdowns like this one of eastern hemlocks. That shallow rootedness of eastern hemlock is is a characteristic, but you rarely will see fire in a hemlock stand. The seeds of eastern hemlock. The cones are tiny. They're about the size of a root beer barrel, if you remember that from the, your childhood. Um, and the seeds themselves within the cones are really tiny, uh, about maybe the size of what would be in your pepper shaker. Uh, and so when they land on, on the uh, forest understory, um, they're very susceptible to drought, to drying. And, uh, and you see in the study down below that 60% uh, of seedlings were severely damaged after only two hours of drying. So, so eastern hemlocks tend to grow on northern slopes, which are mo moister uh, and can, can hold on to that moisture longer. Uh, don't do well in a full sun kind of setting whatsoever because of those tiny seeds falling on the mat of vegetation and having a really difficult time getting going. And they grow really slow. Uh, they grow maybe an inch a year for the first 10 years. So again, that seedling getting established is very susceptible to drought. So they do best uh, hemlocks on top of nurse logs. And a nurse log is simply the big old grandmother tree falling down and slowly rotting. Uh, one study says about 200 years for a, a large hemlock to slowly decompose. And while that decomposition is taking place, all kinds of moss grows on top of that, that the decaying log. And on top of that moss, which, which uh, uh, with, uh, sustains moisture throughout dry periods, uh, these little seeds of hemlock can get started along with yellow birch. And so you end up looking oftentimes in an old growth forest and seeing these straight lines of, of uh, hemlock trees. And you wonder if someone planted them a nose uh, falling on these nurse logs and over time germinating and, and being able to tolerate those droughty conditions. They, they do well on top of stumps. They do well on tip up mounds, uh, mainly because those little seedlings have a hard time getting through all that forest stuff takes about six to 10 years to grow above deer brows height and actually uh, somewhere in the range of 27 to 35 years or so until they're even chest high. So they're a very slow growing tree and they don't re-sprout well at all once a deer browse them. Here's a, a deer exclosure in Boulder Junction. And I don't think it takes a wizard to try to figure out which side of the, the fence the deer have been browsing on. 
So a couple of historical myths to, to take care of quickly that most of Northern Wisconsin was a pinery. It was not. Most of Northern Wisconsin was hemlock hardwood forest with hemlock, sugar maple, yellow birch and basswood as the dominant trees that could withstand shade and do very well within that moist shady environment. So here's a simplified map of the pre-settlement uh, uh, forest co composition of, of Wisconsin. If you look at most of Northern Wisconsin, it's that uh, bright green and it says on your chart there that that's northern mesic forest and northern mesic forest is made up of sugar maple hemlock yellow birch where it's bright red that's where the soils were the poorest the sandy soils which is where I live in southern Iron County on a whole lot of sand and that's a place where pines can do extremely well outcompete the other uh, mo moisture needy kinds of trees uh, the drought the drought resistant trees and that's where the true pinery of, of pines as the climax forest occurred Otherwise, pines were a super canopy component of hemlock hardwood trees, but uh, not a major necessarily component. David Maladinoff, a professor at UW-Madison, went back into all the surveyor records and methodically pulled out all of the, the uh, tree information and came up with this chart of, of what our pre-settlement forests look like percentage-wise. And eastern hemlock was the number one tree in northern Wisconsin, followed by sugar maple and yellow birch, the three major components of hemlock hardwoods. White pine comprised somewhere around 10%, 9 to 10% of the total forest. And so it was not, a, it was a major player, mainly because of the quality of its wood and how big it got, but it wasn't a major player in, in actual abundance. I have a myth that I'd like to just blow away a bit is that all of northern, the north woods of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan looked alike. They certainly did not. If you look at this pre-settlement map, in particular, look at Minnesota and, and that drying that I talked about as you head further west ended up with a, a much more fire disturbance basis for northern Minnesota so that aspen birch was far more common in pre-settlement forests there. Aspen and birch coming in after fire uh, predominantly. Um, so very different than uh, really what Wisconsin and Michigan looked like. Michigan actually had more pinery. That dark green is pine forest. Uh, it had uh, a greater pinery than we did here in Wisconsin. I found this fascinating about Eastern hemlock. The Native Americans did not use hemlock to a significant degree. I found a couple of these usages that are listed here. And some say that uh, Jacques Cartier, uh, crew that was saved from scurvy by supposedly drinking cedar, white cedar tea, may have, may have been hemlock tree. There's others that say it was black spruce tea, so <laughs> who knows? But uh, really a rather limited use by Native Americans of Eastern hemlocks. By the way, it says leaves are used to flavor teas. You can drink, uh, make a nice tea out of Eastern hemlock needles. It's not the same uh, species and genus as uh, Socrates took over in Europe. That's a European uh, uh, plant, a shrub over there. Not at all the Eastern hemlock of Wisconsin. So here we come, uh, uh, Eastern uh, Europe, European, Euro-Americans coming into Wisconsin, coming into the North Woods. And uh, hemlock trees were doomed and they were doomed 3000 plus years ago when we human beings figured out how to uh, uh, tan leather. And leather sandals have been found in Egyptian excavations that are at least 3,300 years old. We, we've known how to do this for a long time. Oak bark was used, uh, it's talked about in the Old Testament. And the word tanning actually comes from the Latin word tannum, meaning oak bark. But when we Europeans showed up here in North America, we of course didn't know what an Eastern hemlock tree was, but somebody figured it out rather rapidly that the bark contains 10% tannic acid and it was all downhill for Eastern hemlock relative to the tanning industry from that point onward. And here we come on all these ships bringing us in, into uh, North America. And of course, we're bringing cattle with us. And when we bring cattle with us, we're gonna bring people who know how to tan that leather and make it into leather products. So you see by these statistics, rather remarkable, Virginia had 500 cattle by 1620 and 20,000 by 1649. Look down at the bottom of the screen. Bottom line, by 1840, there were over 8,000 tanneries throughout America. We talk so much about the logging history of, uh, of the Northern states and give short shrift to uh, the tanning history. There were, tanning was every bit in my opinion and in many other authors' opinions as important as the lumber industry. Here's uh, just a map of, of the, the treaties that were being made uh, with the Native American uh, who had been here for 8,000 plus years prior to our arrival. 
And it's called the Great Swarming as we arrived. Charles Clark, the historian, labeled it as such. If you look at our first uh, census prior to statehood, statehood being 1848, 1840, there were 30,000 people. By 1852 years out of statehood, we're only, we're up to 300,000 already. By 1870, we're a million people. A million people swarming upon in Wisconsin, all needing lumber, but also all needing leather products. So why did we cut nearly all of our forest down? Wood was the way, everything was made out of wood from, from cradles to uh, coffins and everything in between. And wood was in the way, it was in the way in the sense that like this family here, this happy go lucky looking family here in Black River Falls, um, they had to clear that land and plant. They had to get it done now. Uh, so they needed not only to use the wood for products, but they needed to get it out of the way. And the estimate is somewhere from 20 to 50% of all of our forest resources, pine in particular, was burned prior to ever making it to, uh, uh, to, to our logging mills because what if you're a farmer, you needed to cut it down and you had all the slash on the ground, what are you gonna do with all that slash? You're gonna set fire to it. So the reality of when you show up here as a, as a, as a settler is on the left in the dream, that Jeffersonian pastoral dream of sheep and cattle on grasslands is what you're seeking, but uh, there's a long way to go in between those two pictures. So we cut it all down and then 99.8%, there's only 0.2% left and uh, fire was at the pillar lighting the path of empire on its westward way, said William Butler Ogden from the Chicago area. So the ax was the right hand and match was the left hand so that we could end up with landscapes that look like this and we could begin to plant. And cutting hemlock trees was every bit as fast as the pine. And the irony of course was that uh, unlike a sheep, when you shear a sheep, it's still gonna live the next day. We had to cut down the hemlock trees to shear the uh, bark off. And so we would kill the hemlock trees. And hemlock is a very poor lumber as a general rule. It, it uh, has ring shake, which means it separates around the rings. It uh, splinters, it, it warps, uh, it's, it was just, a totally unfavored wood. So much of the time, this, this gosh, looks like a three and a half foot diameter hemlock laying here on the ground would have been let to, to rot after the bark had been taken off because it was so uh, lacking in favor. We had better forest products and it wasn't being used in the forest products industry until the 1890s as a general rule. We we're finally running out of everything else and uh, people had to start using it. The tanneries moved out of the out of the northeastern part of the of the U.S. slowly, and, and they moved. You know, a tannery would be established every twenty to thirty miles or so because to carry all this bark back to the tannery was, uh, you know, a difficult job on poor roads, being dragged on wagons, and so you'd uh, cut down all the hemlock trees within a reasonable distance from your tannery. And then once they're all cut down, you move the tannery uh, because the, the cost and the difficulty in moving all that bark to get to the tannery was too much. So talking about uh, just in the upper North New York state, uh, 70 million, they estimate, hemlock trees were harvested for the bark. Healing of hemlock took place uh, May through July. They had this four man crew and you see how they're, how they're divided into different jobs. The guy in the back with the beard must've been the uh, the foreman of the crew making sure all those young guys do the work that they're supposed to do. George Corrigan wrote, uh, hopefully many of you read this book, Cock Boots and Cant Hooks. It was up here in Iron County where I live. And he wrote about, uh, uh, about taking the bark off of those hemlocks. And he said, the men who peeled hemlock bark were the hardest, toughest working men connected with woods work. About two thirds of the time, they're covered with mosquitoes, black flies and no seams. It was a long way from a picnic in the woods he firmly believed that the men of the hemlock and hardwood era were equal to the men of the white pine era in every way. White pine guys running those logs downstream always get, they get all the, the romance and nobody gives any romance to these uh, poor guys working in, in June with all the skeeters and black flies killing them, uh, cutting the hemlock bark. What they use for fly dope? Uh, I can't imagine pine tar mixed with bacon grease or pure lard, yikes. Um, and interestingly enough, when they're cutting, they're cutting at this time because the hemlock sap is, is up in the tree and they want that. And so in cutting it, uh, they're going to get this sap all over themselves and the stickiness led uh, the, the barkers to refer to it as slime. And they get so much on themselves that when they would go home, they could take their clothes off, says George Corrigan, and those clothes would stand up by themselves when taken off because all they had so much slime on them. 
box uh, slabs were all stacked in, in cord uh, units and left to cure into late fall and then picked up by wagons and, and hauled uh, to tanneries if their tanneries were close enough. And here actually is a, is a cord of bark uh, that a friend found in Iron County it must have uh, uh, been left over from the early 1920s or as a tannery in Mellon. And this was in the area that that was. And uh, the tannery went out in 1922. So I imagine it was cut in 1921 or 22. It was supposed to be heading to that tannery and it went bankrupt and bingo. You, here's a hundred years later, that bark is still there. So here's what's amazing to me. A cord of bark was said to tan four to five hides and it took four to five trees to make a cord of bark. By my advanced math, that means one of hemlock tree was converted into one tanned hide. I've seen other estimates saying that it took one hemlock tree to tan two hides. So it was one to two somewhere in that ballpark. But the bottom line is it took an, an enormous number of hemlock trees to tan all the hides that were coming into Wisconsin. And all this bark again was being hauled by wagon. And then, uh, you know, if they needed to get it down to Milwaukee or down to Racine and Sheboygan, all these areas along Lake Michigan, they'd be put on sloops or on trains if they, if they were available and, and taken to those tanneries. And uh, just some amazing uh, statistics in the literature talking about a mile of stacks of hemlock bark in one year would supply one large tannery. It's almost unfathomable, a mile of hemlock bark, even if they're 50% off, how about half a mile of hemlock bark? Just astonishing amount of bark being cut to tan leather. Here's a wagon load. These horses were uh, probably not amused by this picture taking. Um, at Rib Lake, had a big tannery there in Rib Lake. Here's another wagon load in the Phillips area. Again, the horses were uh, not in a laughing mood about this. And you wonder if it's just picture day and they're just trying to, or whether or not in fact those horses could actually move that amount of, of weight. They're saying it was 42 tons. I don't know, I don't know how you weigh that. Also being moved by train, being moved by uh, sailing sloops. Here, here's bark being brought to the Allen and Sons Tannery in Kenosha. And here's some of these bark stacks. Here's uh, at Rib Lake in 1915. These guys stacking all that, all that bark up. Here's some bark stacks in Tomahawk in Lincoln County. And I love this picture of, of uh, some woman at the N.R. Allen Tannery in Kenosha. Uh, it's World War I, so the men are, are gone to war and the women are now taking their jobs in the in the tannery there and why they're posing on top of all this hemlock bark I have no clue but it's a really kind of fascinating uh, photo of of a cultural shift in that women were working in these tanneries uh, when the men at least were gone to war. First tannery in Milwaukee the the Fister Vogel tannery 1848 occurred uh, and by 1870, there were 30 tanneries going on in Milwaukee, which is just astonishing to me. Frederick Vogel, uh, see the picture of him there. I've gotten to know the, the Vogel family. They're still in Milwaukee. Uh, Frederick III and his wife, Anne, are just absolutely lovely people. And son, Eric, who was Frederick Eric Vogel IV, uh, know a great deal about this history. And I would highly recommend um, that the Forest History Association somehow uh, work with some of these families that are still uh, existent in, in the Milwaukee area and maybe in other areas uh, who could give presentations on their particular family history relative to these tanneries because it's pretty fascinating. Thousands of people were employed in these tanneries for a very long period of time. So Guido Pfister came over here from Germany uh, in 1845, came into Milwaukee 1847 and established uh, the Guido Pfister Tanning Company in 1853. He was, uh, as I get it, uh, the businessman of the of the two. Frederick Vogel was the guy who knew how to, to tan, to tan the leather. He was the bark tanning expert. And he'd begun tanning in 1848, combined with Pfister in uh, 1853 to uh, form their, their, the, the Pfister Vogel uh, Tanning Company. And here's a picture from 1923, just an absolutely huge facility. And here's some of these saline sloops coming in, some, some of those bark stacks uh, in front of the Fister Vogel tannery. The story of tanning is, is just amazing, just really it's such a hard work and such an art and it took so long. It's really, uh, it's just remarkable to read about. I'm just gonna give you a really quick overview of it. 
So the bark had to be manhandled off all these trains and wagons, and then it had to be ground up and cooked into what they called ooze. And, and the ooze had to be all these different strengths along the way because it took anywhere from four months to a year to tan a hide. And they would move the hides uh, through these various vats with different strengths of ooze depending upon the kind of hide, if it was a sheep hide versus a cow hide versus a deer hide and different species of all those things and, and where they were coming from, they were bringing in leather from, certainly from Chicago, the slaughterhouse capital of the world, but also from all over the United States and actually from all, all sorts of other countries. All, all, all this leather, these leather goods coming in, these hides coming in via sailing ships. So this, the skins had to be moved off of these sailing ships amid slush and stench by men in great boots. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so here, you know, they had, to, uh, they had to scrape these hides, first soaked them in water to remove the salt because they had to be salted to be sent over from wherever they were in order to uh, not rot on the way. They had to be fleshed of all the fat and blood. And then they would uh, soak them in a lime solution for somewhere up almost to a week. And then they had to be washed to again, remove the lime uh, in a neutralizing acid solution. And what I found just amazing was what they used to neutralize the lime was a, a brew made up of manure. And uh, I'm gonna read you a piece that, that speaks to this exactly. John Finkston in an interview uh, uh, in 1952 that it is available, lots of interviews of people, by the way, in the Matson Holbrook uh, files at the Wisconsin Historical Society from 1952. They interviewed a bunch of these guys that were still living um, from the early days of those tanneries. But he, here he's talking about utilizing this manure brew. And I just, I just have to read this because it's just so amazing. He says, after a week in pure lime, they were hauled, the skins that were, the hides were hauled and placed in large re revolving wash drums, a hundred at a time and washed in 70 degree warm water for a half hour to remove all the lime from the skins. The wash skins were placed in large paddle wheels that had a capacity of a thousand skins. A paddle wheel was, uh, oh, it doesn't matter what that is, the temperature was kept at 90 degrees. To deline the skins in these days, tanners used either chicken or pigeon manure that had to be collected by the tanners by sending men with teams of horses and empty barrels to call on the farmers to clean out the coops and pay the farmer a dollar per, bu per bushel. These manure collectors often traveled 75 to 100 miles as the tanners depended on the manure and the teamsters could not return empty handed. How the tanners in those early days knew that chicken or pigeon manure would neutralize the lime in the skins, I never found out. As far as I ever found out, that manure was used for this purpose more than a thousand years ago and no one ever thought of using a substitute. No tanner bothered as long as manure would do the trick and was doing well to neutralize the lime. The use of manure to de-lime was a dirty and smelly job. The tanner took four pails of manure and put same into a 50 gallon barrel barrel, added lukewarm water to same, and soaked the manure for eight to 10 days. By the end of 10 days, the manure baiting solution was ripe. And what a stink it was. And he goes on to say, uh, although I washed my hands thoroughly when he gets home, when I ate my supper at night, I could smell manure in my hands. And the only way to rid myself of that awful order was I washed my hands with chloride of lime and I found that helped. Who knew? So then, uh, you know, the hides being cut into these sides, and, and as I said, all going through all these various vats, and over many, many months, and, and there's all these arguments about how to tan these hides, and it's just fascinating. And a tannery worker at the bottom says the tanner was never a tanner until they'd fallen into some kind of vat in the tannery, and we've all done it. I'm sure you just walk in that little plank there between these vats, you lose your balance, and bingo, you're getting tanned in the ooze. What a deal. So I love this uh, quote by William Brockman who worked at the Becker Leather Company in Milwaukee. He says, there are headaches in all tanneries. I told Al Vogel lots of times, if you want headaches, if you want grief, get yourself a job in a tannery and you'll get them because you never know when you're right and you never know when you're wrong because it was just so dang complex to figure out each of these hides, how to move it through over these course of months and, and do it so that it was done perfectly. And then, you know, at the end, you had to make sure you dried it in the right amount of time and didn't let it get too wet or it could rot and on and on and on. You know, and so you had, living next to a tannery uh, was awful. There was all this stench and all these pools, of waste materials. And so streams, the Milwaukee River, I'm sure was just a cesspool because uh, all these tanneries were being located right on rivers so they can uh, get rid of all of, of their waste products and order, in order to have big boats come in with, with all the tanning bark. 
what was going on in forestry conservation, as I said earlier, most of these trees are being left on the ground, the hemlocks being left on the ground to, to rot. Here's an 1882 report from the Chief Division of Forestry saying uh, it's necessary to destroy the trees and procuring the bark and in older countries where proper attention is given, care is taken to provide new growth. Not only has this been neglected in this country, but the timber itself from which the bark has been peeled has often been, and in some cases is still left to rot on the ground. Our native bark has in very many cases been nearly exhausted and but a few manufacturers can look forward to many years for abundant supplies. You know, in, in doing this book on old growth forests and in looking at the hemlock industry, because mostly because of my interest in hemlock trees, uh, I found probably the best source of information on hemlock tanneries from a master's thesis written by a fellow named Charles Schiff in 1938. It's really quite a document and worth anybody interested in this really should get a copy of that out of the UW-Madison. They'll, they'll get a photocopy it for you. Anyway, he has lots of charts and maps and so forth. And here's one of his uh, maps of the location of tanneries in uh, Wisconsin and the darker shaded areas where we have more than five tanneries. So you'll see you, what four counties had more than five tanneries, Milwaukee County and Racine in particular, along with Jefferson County and Manitowoc County. But then all these other counties had one to five uh, tanneries in them as well. So total number of tanneries in the state, I really don't know. Could be upwards of a hundred, could be as, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, it, it takes a historian worth their salt far more than me to tease all this information out. So there's pictures, lots of pictures of these tanneries uh, in all of these uh, little county his, historical books. Here's just a few. Fayette Shaw was an Easterner who came to Wisconsin and established a number of tanneries in, in Northern Wisconsin in particular. So you see his name here on a few of these. And by the 1890s, uh, some folks were saying, hey, we really need to start trying to build stuff with hemlock. And so in, in uh, Medford, the idea, they got the idea, let's try to figure it out. And they built this, uh, one of the things that was built was the Winchester Hotel, apparently totally out of, out of hemlock, but then was torn down and only 30 or so years later, and uh, that lumber was then repurposed to build some churches uh, all around Northern Wisconsin. They built their uh, sidewalks from what I understand in, in Medford out of, out of hemlock originally, but again, hemlock was, a, was a, an unpreferred wood. Now in my old house here in Manitowoc where I live, built in 1907, our uh, two by fours are hemlock. And when I ask people about uh, hemlock and saying, oh, nobody would build out if they could, and always there's someone said, oh, but my house is built out of hemlock. And I said, well, was whoever built it really poor? And they said, yeah, it was really poor. Because if you had a choice, you would not have chosen hemlock. So uh, just to bring this to an end, uh, there's so much to say about the hemlock bark industry, but chromium salts uh, are now used for tanning leather and had been invented in the late 1800s, but just because of inertia, I mean, they knew how to, to tan with with bark and didn't want to move into chromium salts if they could help but it, it, it got moved into chromium salts by the 1920s, early 1920s. And so the hemlock bark tanning industry was severely curtailed in. And also, all you know, there's all these changes going on. We we're starting to have cars and uh, here's a variety of different vehicles that are coming on online now in the early 1920s. So the bottom's dropping out of the leather market because uh, we don't need horses anymore. And interestingly enough, one of the things they talked about was shoes. Uh, you used to have to have really high shoes because you're walking in all this mud and you're getting splattered by horses going by and so forth. But now we're building roads and we're putting vehicles on there. And so now you could buy smaller shoes and that's of course gonna reduce the amount of leather that's needed in the industry. So that's an incredibly quick overview of the hemlock industry uh, in Wisconsin. There's a whole lot more to say, but time doesn't allow it. Let's talk just about hemlocks today. Hemlocks were about 13, 14% of the original Northern forest now represent somewhere around one to 2% of the Northern forest. So here's a, a map of the modern forest of the Great Lakes state. So if you can remember that previous map, a lot of it was a darker green that was uh, the, what was called the Northern Mesic forest. And I mentioned it was Eastern hemlock, sugar maple, basswood, yellow birch. And now you see it now is lighter green in this map and it's called maple, basswood and birch mainly because hemlock has been fundamentally removed. So we've restored the forests of Northern Wisconsin, um, but we certainly haven't restored, we haven't restored them compositionally. Uh, we've removed most of the conifers or a lot of the conifers and we removed hemlock and we removed white pine. 
and uh, we've converted it to, to northern hardwoods. So what's left of hemlocks in, uh, in Wisconsin? Great question, in particular of old growth uh, hemlocks. Uh, Randy Hoffman uh, is a superb ecologist that worked uh, for the DNR and now retired and an author of several books that I would recommend to you. I asked him to give me his best estimate and here's what he said. For, so for hemlock, 150 plus years old, which, and remember hemlock three to 400 years is really an age, a normal age for them. Um, we only have 6,600 or so acres left. And remember that a square mile is 640 acres. So we have about 10 square miles. That's all we got left of true old growth hemlock. White pine's a, even a sorrier story, but just a little over a thousand acres left. So why should we care? Eastern hemlocks provide all these unique microhabitats that very dense foliage uh, it, uh, re they retain because they tolerate shade. They retain their lower branches, unlike a lot of pines that shade out their lower branches and, and they self prune. So the dense foliage creates all these moist microclimate uh, circumstances for a variety of species that can do very well in those habitats with those lower branches that are, that are full of full foliage. And there's this very furrowy bark which is used by a bunch of birds. So I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of a number of birds that utilize hemlock, uh, studied by Bob Howe and Mike Mossman in 1995. Didn't find any obligate species. No species have to have hemlocks or they won't survive, but quite a number of species do way better, including black-throated greens, winter wrens, and little red-breasted nuthatch you see there in the photo and so forth. Most abundant species, uh, bird species, in the hardwoods and hemlocks in these older uh, forests was uh, the oven bird, but second was the black-throated green warbler. David Mladenov provided this uh, comparison of pre-settlement forests where we had old growth hemlock hardwoods compared to today and showing that uh, black-throated greens were th three and a half times as abundant in those old growth hemlock forests as they are today in our managed stands. Black Bernian warbler was a common bird of, and this is still a relatively common bird, but found in these few remain, in particular in these few remaining hemlock stands, they nest way high up there and you get hemlock, not hemlock, you get warbler neck, trying to see these guys typically way up there. It's just a gorgeous little warbler. And last, uh, just as one of the birds is uh, northern goshawks and they prefer a, a mature forest, 60 to 90% of their other nests are found in mature to old growth forests and do very well in these uh, hemlock hardwood forests. Wintering birds also like hemlocks because they hold onto their cones and uh, birds like red, red crossbills and white wing crossbills and pine siskins utilize uh, hemlocks. And you know, it's a great place if you're a little bird to get out of the wind and out of the snow in that uh, lower foliage that is retained pretty much perpetually. Some ecological processes of old growth, uh, when these big trees fall down, it provides coarse woody habitat on the ground. This little winter wren likes to nest in that big root ball right there. So tip up mounds have a, a biological function, at least as far as a winter wren is concerned. Um, and all that coarse woody debris on the floor provides cover. And so those old old hemlocks falling down and other uh, sugar maples and so forth provide all cover for species that nest on the ground like hermit thrushes and oven birds. And here's a list of, I believe there's 32 birds in here that are ground nesters. Some are grassland birds, but a lot of them nest in forest habitats. So cleanliness is not next to godliness. Leave it to Gary Larson to sum it up very well. Clean it up, clean it up. Criminy, it's supposed to be a rat hole. Yeah, forests are supposed to have dead and dying trees in the understory, both standing and laying on the ground slowly decaying because they provide habitat. We have 30 species of cavity nesters in Wisconsin that require dead and dying trees, including dead and dying hemlocks. So there's a few of them for you to look at. And they also provide den trees, these old old dead and dying trees for a variety of, of mammals. Just very quickly, where are the best stands of hemlock that we have left in the state? If you wanna go visit them, I've listed actually 11 here and I'll just go through three or four and then I'll be done. The Guido Rar Forest uh, Tenderfoot Reserve is up on the border of Michigan and Wisconsin uh, near Land O'Lakes. Yeah, kind of halfway between Presque Isle and Land O'Lakes. You have to paddle in to get to uh, the, this 971 acre stand owned by the Nature Conservancy now, about 500 acres are old growth. And classic look in that particular forest as you're walking along are these two foot plus typical uh, size old growth hemlocks that are you know, most uh, well over 200 years old. There's some much bigger ones, three foot ones in that 
woods as well. Plum Lake uh, is Hemlock Forest State Natural Area is right near the little town of Star Lake. You can see that up in the right hand corner of this map in Vilas County. Uh, the oldest trees there have been cored to be at least 270 years old. So it's this isthmus between Star Lake and Plum Lake, 747 acres, I believe is the size of that state natural area. And here I am walking one of the trails there and with some blowdowns. Uh, those actually might be white pines that are blown down. Oh, they might be, it looks like some hemlock needles there. And there's our little uh, Australian shepherd who's been in more old growth forest than any dog in uh, Wisconsin, I'll bet. There is a little hey, delay in your photos, uh, John, just so you know. You're getting a delay? All right, I'll slow down, I apologize. Um, they're coming up quick on my screen, but I'm in Manitwish where Lord knows we're lucky to have any internet connection at all. Uh, so Van Vliet Hemlocks um, in Vilas County, uh, oh, not too far from Boulder Junction and Manitwish Waters, uh, 400 plus acres, uh, owned once by the Board of Commissioners on Public Land, then recently sold to the DNR in an interesting state-to-state -state land deal and a series of, uh, of trails that you can hike in the Van Vliet Hemlocks uh, that have been established by the friends of the Van Vliet Hemlocks. So a great place to go walking in old growth, well signed. You can't get lost unless you really try. And you can see some places that were logged and uh, majority of places that were not. What's neat about that particular site is that the Friends of Van Vliet Forest have produced uh, an interpretive trail on part of, part of the site and they've uh, put a number of signs up and here's one of the signs along the trail all about hemlocks utilizing some of these uh, photos that I was showing and a couple that I didn't show you uh, but uh, tried to make sure that people in walking that particular trail would understand a little of this history of of how hemlocks fueled the Wisconsin leather tanneries. Within the big city of Rhinelander in Oneida County is a state natural area called the Holmbo Conifer Forest. Um, and it's an aerial view right along the, the Pelican River as it's about to, to enter the, uh, uh, the Wisconsin River. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, what's interesting to me about this is that across the river is, is the water treatment plant. You can see uh, to the left, which would be to the west, is uh, uh, what well, was once a, a nursing home and there's one across the street that's a nursing home. And a little further to the west is a concrete plant. And all of that, of course, is what happens with the development, but uh, for reasons uh, of, of wonderful conservation by a particular family, uh, this particular stand got saved right in the city of Rhinelander, and most people in the city of Rhinelander don't even know it's there. So there's a, a mile or so uh, of trail that you can walk through uh, right in town uh, and see some old growth hemlocks and a few uh, super canopy white pines as well. And then there's a stand uh, of uh, hemlocks and beautiful yellow birch and some super canopy white pines and the Patterson hemlocks, which is in Price County, right near the border of Vilas as well, uh, and Iron, it's uh, where a bunch of counties come together. Um, no specific trails are marked in there, but there's a number of old logging roads in there. So uh, the place has been logged to a, a small degree, but uh, there's some beautiful old growth in that particular site as well. And those trees are 240 years old plus, you know, that's just a, a sampling of coring. If one really tried hard, I'm sure you could find some older ones. What are the threats to hemlocks? Uh, this little tiny insect called a hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, of course, uh, an invasive species from Asia. It's 1 32nd of an inch long, so you can't even see the dang thing unless you basically have a hand lens. And this, so here's a, a person holding some hemlock, a hemlock twig in their hand. And that little powdery, cottony kind of fluff is inside of that are the hemlock woolly adelgids, and they're feeding on the sap at the base of the needles, sucking that juice out and uh, disrupting the nutrient flow and killing trees. And hemlock woolly adelgids have killed millions of hemlock, eastern hemlock trees now, all throughout the Appalachian Mountains and all the way up through New England and into southern Maine now. Um, and all kinds of efforts trying to uh, uh, prevent any further spread and utilizing some uh, uh, native species uh, beetles to try to uh, act as, as 
the predator on these woolly adelgids, but not with a great deal of success from my understanding. The worry, of course, is that this uh, insect has now made its way into Ohio and it very likely is gonna make its way into Wisconsin at some point. And what few hemlocks we have left are uh, in, in great jeopardy. So at some point, I imagine we'll see this tiny little insect showing up. So here's just some a picture of uh, some of the dead hemlocks in, in the Smoky Mountains, all these uh, beautiful big old trees dying. And once, once they die, they're not re-sprouting. The conifer doesn't re-sprout. Wonderful book uh, that I'd recommend if you wanna know about the the woolly adelgid and, and the whole ecological idea of what do you do when you end up with an invasive species that's gonna kill millions of, of, of an individual species, what's the proper response? And uh, David Foster, who is uh, the director of the Harvard uh, Forest out in, in Massachusetts, wrote this book to, uh, three years ago now called Hemlock and Forest Giant on the Edge. And he talks at great length about what would be the appropriate management strategies that we should consider uh, when we're going to see a keynote species of our eastern forests decimated, uh, what should be our response? What, what should we as forest managers and citizens do? Another book by a guy named Tim Palmer has written all kinds of books on the twilight of hemlocks and uh, uh, beech trees. Beech trees have beech bark disease and uh, uh, we're seeing a demise of an awful lot, tens of thousands of probably millions of beech trees as well. Uh, and uh, beech bark disease is into Wisconsin now. The key to preventing woolly adelgid in Wisconsin is winter. So one, uh, one of the many reasons for talking about climate change is to save our hemlock trees. Because hem hemlock woolly adelgids start dying when it's five degrees below, not below zero, but minus five degrees Fahrenheit. And in one study that I was reading, 100% mortality occurred at 31 degrees below zero. And that's awful cold, but that's not unusual for Northern Wisconsin. We used to be a zone three where we would hit minus 30 to minus 40. We're now zone four where we hit minus 20 to minus 30. But if we can push that up just a little bit, get a, <laughs> somehow get really cold again, uh, we stand a chance of the woolly adelgids not being as big a factor, at least for us as they've been everywhere else in the Eastern United States. So last slide, just to conclude with a quote, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or at least attempt to and or hear your better story, stories about hemlocks. Rick Bass, uh, a writer out west says, to stand amid the last uncut old growth groves of giant cedar, white pine and hemlock, some of these trees nearly a thousand years old is to be reminded that we're still capable of experiencing the greatest depths of peace and humility. Love these endangered places with all your heart while they're still here because a great society's legacy should be the wild places it protects, not the ones it removes. Love them not less but harder and more passionately. So I'll end there. And uh, if anyone's still around, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. This, stories. this is Tom Giroux. I'll be uh, asking John the questions here. And we'll start off. We've got quite a few in the chat box. If you'd like to enter them into the chat box, you can start doing so. So Ed asked about when they started to use some of the hemlock and I think you answered that in the one slide with the uh, building that was built and they started using some of the wood from the henlocks, I think what he was asking. But then he went on to ask about, can you still find logs laying in the wood, uh, in the woods from the hemlock era? Boy. Well, given that the, the one study I was citing says that it takes 200 years for hemlocks to fully decompose, I would imagine a number of the trees that I've looked at over the years that are loaded with moss and that are getting pretty punky could actually be from that era of the late 1890s, early 1900s. Uh, undoubtedly they are. I don't know how to age them, however, to, to know that particular date, but I'll, be, I'll bet quite a few are, yeah. Yeah, and you would uh, see those nurse logs when you're out there, some of those might be from that era, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Christopher asked, you indicated that hemlock is not good for lumber or wood, but was it ever used for pulp wood or for making paper products? My understanding is it still is used for pulp. It's, um, and if there's someone here who's more familiar with the paper industry, that'd be great for them to chime in. But I'm, I understand it's not a favored wood. It's not, not as good as 
spruce or, or aspen, but it is used to some degree, but it, it apparently is not real easy on the, on the machinery used to chip it up to begin with. So uh, it isn't something that's a desired species, but it is used some. Uh, did the tanning uh, from the Pfister Vogel operation create the funding for the Pfister Hotel, Ed asks? <laughs> I don't know, but I imagine so. Yeah, there was a lot of wealth generated by those tanneries, no doubt about it. Milwaukee led the world in tanning, and I, I guess I forgot to say that in the early 1900s. And the statistic that always blew my mind was in 1907, the estimate was that Milwaukee, just Milwaukee tanneries alone, not all the other tanneries in the state, but Milwaukee tanneries tanned 2 million hides. Well, if we have a one-to-one -one ratio of hemlock trees to hides, well, we're talking about a million plus hemlock trees or more being used alone in Milwaukee tanneries in one year to tan hide. So the, how many tens of millions of, of hemlock trees were cut down to, uh, to tan all the leather, leather in this state uh, is a fascinating question and I, will never be answered, I don't think, unless someone is incredibly uh, talented at, at trying to find all these old tannery records and and trace all the, the bark, uh, tens of millions that we can assume many tens of millions of hemlock trees being. So uh, Deborah asked about the places to go see hemlocks. And I think you kind of answered that. And I just wanted to let people know if you weren't able to write it down, uh, the uh, program will be recorded and it'll be on our YouTube. Uh, one of our members will put it up probably tomorrow. So you could go back to the recording and get some of those locations. But I just wanted to mention that I live two blocks from that uh, hemlock forest in the city of Rhinelander. And so the photograph that I used for the forest history conference was in the Humboldt forest. I was looking for a photograph off the internet and you needed a uh, you know, of course you need permission to use it that I was going to download and pay for something and I said wait a minute there's a forest right down the street here and I went down and took the picture and I think it looks pretty great uh, so uh, it's an easy one to get to uh, it's pretty small though compared to some of the other ones uh, I've been to the Tenderfoot <laughs> Reserve and it is an amazing place but it is a feat to get there I will tell you that Anything else you wanted to add to that, uh, John? All right, uh, Karen uh, seems to indicate that there were some tanneries in Price and Taylor counties. Uh, and she seems to think they were yeah. Shaw tanneries. Taylor. Okay. She did. Yeah, Taylor County uh, had Perkins Town. Perkinstown was the site. A lot of hemlocks in Taylor County. Taylor County actually was one of the places in Wisconsin to grow hemlock trees. I'm sorry, I don't tanneries. I just remember Perkinstown in particular. And I, I can't remember, I don't think Rib Lake is in Taylor County. I can't remember. It's near there, uh, but that was a large tannery as well. Okay, so you should be able to answer this from personal experience doing home renovation projects, but <laughs> what makes hemlock so undesirable for use in buildings? Well, so it, and I mentioned this earlier, it splinters when you, when you run a nail into it. It's actually a very hard wood. It's a, you know, it's a quote, quote, soft wood conifer, but it's not, it's hard. <laughs> so like that, the two by fours in my house that you can hardly pull those dang nails out of them. And now that, that hemlock is 115 years old now. But so it splinters, it does what's called ring shake. So you cut down, you cut the log and you know around the growth rings, the wood separates. And so it's it's not a stable wood in that regard. And it warps like crazy. So if you want, you know, you gotta dry wood before you can put it up anywhere. And so you stack it and it tends to go a whole bunch of different directions that, that you don't want it to go. So those are the main reasons I know of. But people have built with it and done fine, but it's a it's more of a struggle. Uh, so Colleen Matula wanted to put a vote in for the Enterprise Hemlocks. 
as an interesting yeah. area to visit. And Colleen's a very good forest ecologist of her own. Uh, and and that, that picture that I showed of that uh, remaining cord of hemlock, I think was Colleen's picture. So I stole it from Colleen without giving her proper credit as I was going through the uh, slideshow. I think that was Colleen's. So thank you, Colleen. Um, so Ed asks, are, are you seeing evidence of reproduction at the hemlock sites you have visited? Well, yes and no. Uh, and hemlock reproduction remains a great mystery to me uh, because it's so erratic. Um, I can be in a stand like the Van Vliet stand and you can walk for 10 minutes and not see a single dang one reproducing and then you'll see a dense stand doing just fine. Now, you know, you have all that shade and you have the, the difficulty with getting the seedlings established in the first place, but you also have deer herbivory. And, you know, even though a lot of folks want to say we don't have very many deer in Northern Wisconsin, we got plenty for, uh, for browsing hemlocks. In a, and that's a desired place, a desired winter uh, site uh, is to be underneath those big old hemlocks because it holds the, the snow out and, and keeps the wind out. So if you're a deer, great winter site for the five months, but you're going to eat yourself out of house and home in that place real quick. And uh, hemlock doesn't do well once it's being browsed. So we don't see a whole lot of reproduction as a general rule, but other places you can see it densely doing well. Interestingly enough, it seems to do well along road cuts. So uh, where I do see it, like at the Van Vliet site, is I'll see it right on the edge of where the old roads went in. There's a little bit of sunlight getting in there and it does particularly well, but go back in 10 feet and you're not gonna find a single one. So it's a bit of a mystery to me. It needs moist, cool habitat to, to survive. And if it doesn't have that, it's not gonna do it. And if you have too many deer, it's not gonna survive. It's real, it's very finicky. Uh, so a little story about uh, the Van Vliet and Mlocks. I had out of town visitors from the big city and I thought, well, I'll take them out and see some great old growth uh, forest. And I've been to the Van Vliet before, it's beautiful. Uh, we went in June and <laughs> the black <laughs> flies, the mosquitoes, <laughs> the midges, it was just horrible. Yeah. And we cut short the walk, but uh, they uh, learned what the loggers had to put up with the dealing <laughs> that uh, park. It was just miserable. Uh, so Susan asked about uh, hemlocks in Europe. Are there hemlock species in Europe? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, in the U.S., we have western hemlock. In the in the western states, it's even a bigger tree than our eastern hemlocks. I honestly don't know if there's hemlock species in Europe. I'm sorry. Uh, something for you to do some research on. Uh, yeah. Colleen notes that uh, pallets are often made with hem hemlock today, as well as landscape chips. Really? OK. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, so I about, uh, uh, Rib Lake Sawmill at Rib Lake and uh, Neeland McLurg Mill at Phillips mainly cut hemlock, as I understand it. Uh, it was a box factory box in Phillips. Yeah, again, you're not gonna make anything that you need straight lumber for like windows or doors. You're gonna make boxes or pallets. That would be a good use of, of a poor lumber. Uh, did hemlock float and did they ever do log drives? My understanding is hemlock doesn't float. It's a pretty dense conifer, so it would sink and, but I could be corrected on I don't, you know, we talk about pines being what floated and what we did the log drives with, but I don't think we were floating the hemlocks, but I, I'm happy to be corrected if anybody knows different. Oh, well, here we go. Karen says she has a photo of hemlock being floated in the Spirit River. Like Perkins Town. Okay, there you go. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Boy, I would not have thought that at all. It's really a heavy wood. Interesting. Uh, the melon tannery, according to Colleen, lasted until 1927. Oh, my statistics say 1922, so she and I are going to have a little discussion about that. 
All right. In my Iron County Centennial book, it says, I see it right here on my bookshelf, A Journey into Mellon. <laughs> You'll have some, uh, a nice discussion, I'm sure. There you go. Five year difference. Who cares? Yep. Ed uh, suggests that we kill more deer. <laughs> We're all in favor of that. Yeah, we are. Eight, five pounds of woody browse a day on average in, in, in forest ecosystems. They're a terrible, terrible, harmful critter in the winter. So uh, Karen uh, placed in the chat a link to uh, Memorial Grove hemlocks. Yes. In uh, Price County. In Price County. Yep. Great spot. Yeah. Very small stand though. Yeah, there was uh, another comment about uh, hemlocks being used in some of the paper industry in New York. Okay. And Tom, I'm not trying to do a, a plug for my book at all, but if people want to know where these sites are, there is a book that gives you all those old growth sites and where to go like Memorial Grove and so forth and so on. Cause I spent 15 years messing around trying to find all of them. So it's in, Get so, it from the library. Don't don't buy it. You know. Yeah. So the name of the book. Oh, it's Our Living Ancestors: The History and Ecology of Old Growth Forests in Wisconsin. So I list the fifty best sites in my very very humble opinion that are left in the state, and then the fifty best of the rest. So hundred different sites that you can go to to get what little we have left. We don't have a square mile of of upland old growth forest left in the entire state that I could find anyway. So it, we did a fabulous job of cutting most of it down. Uh, Jim Peterson just made a comment that his uh, grandfather, Ole Peterson from Spirit, had bark contracts in the early 1900s. So that's interesting. Wow, tougher man than me. Uh, Mike uh, says from his experience, even today, before snow, I was in a hemlock stand. The seabed is key and the sun sunlight is too. And uh, you also- yeah, they can you know, shape. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, they can tolerate shade very well, but they really like it if they can get a little sun. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. He also comments that uh, some mineral soil would be helpful for uh, generation too. It's true. They don't do well in pure sand up here. Um, April asked, how many tanneries are there today? And you talked a little bit about them using chromium salts instead of uh, bark, but. I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I suspect, like a lot of things, those uh, operations have uh, moved overseas. You know, I know a lot of our shoe manufacturing is done overseas now, and so I imagine they're tanning in uh, some of those countries too. It's a, everything seems like it's a world market. Yeah. I'm gonna go. I just was in the Q and A. I'm gonna go one more time back to the chat, and then. Uh, We'll turn it over to John for any concludes, concluding remarks. I have a lot of comments, John, in the uh, chat uh, about the presentation. Lots of positive feedback. Everybody enjoyed it. So thank you very much. And I don't see any uh, additional questions. So just a lot of uh, uh, thanks. Thank you. It's a great topic. And with that, are we, uh, are we at a close, Tom? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Well, once again, I think this is gonna be a, a this is a recorded presentation and I have an expectation that it's going to be visited a lot uh, at the site. Uh, we do, all of the uh, webinars are recorded and will be posted to our, our YouTube uh, uh, posting. And, and we're going to devise uh, an improvement, I think, to the web. So we've got links at our website to take you there easily. So be aware of that. Um, 
I should offer it as well. One of your commenters was is from Bob Roosh of uh, Rib Lake. And Great. those with the continuing interest, I'd encourage you to, to uh, do a web search for the Rib Lake Historical Society. Yes. Uh, it, was, it was sort of a, a hotbed of, of tanning activity and the, uh, the hemlock bark industry. And they've got a, just a wonderful website with a lot of information that you might, uh, you might consider if you want to learn more. I agree. As you close, I, I want to uh, encourage you to, to take a look at our website, Forest History Association of Wisconsin, uh, and the things we offer there. We have an interest in serving the needs of folks who are simply history buffs uh, and, can, and have an interest in, in how we came to, uh, to be who we are as a leader in sustainable forestry. But also take, consider that we're trying to do outreach to teachers and K-12 uh, systems. Uh, and, and we value your comments. Uh, there's a spot there to offer a, an email to us with questions or advice uh, that we'd welcome you to take and consider joining us as an organization. Uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty nominal fee to join and you, you get from that an, an annual proceedings of all the things that will be covered in our conferences or webinars and uh, quarterly newsletters and an opportunity to join the discussion about how we move forward and make people more aware of how we got to where we are. So thank you once again, John, for, for an outstanding presentation. And thank you all for uh, taking the time to join us in this program. You have a great evening. Thank you.